This is Karen Kuniyuki with the Emanuel School of Fine Arts, and today I'm going to talk to you about pointillism. This is a style of mark making that can be used to create a variety of compositions. To do our project today, you're going to need some sturdy watercolor or cardstock paper, some regular water soluble markers, a fine point paintbrush, a water cup and paper towel, and you can use watercolor paint as well if you'd like. So the history of pointillism, um, the basics are, it came from the post-impressionist movement. It was invented by a painter named George Seurat, and he took impressionist artwork to a whole new level, using only small dots of pure color to compose the entire painting. Another painter named Paul Signac was a very lo loyal follower of George Seurat, and um, carried on his work when Seurat died at the early age of 32. Pointillism reached its peak in the 1880s and the 1890s, and many of the concepts and ideas of pointillism are still used today by some artists. Unlike some art movements, pointillism has nothing to do with the subject matter of the painting and everything to do with the specific way of applying the paint to the canvas or the paper. In pointillism, the painting is made up entirely of small dots of pure color. George Seurat studied the science of colors and optics to invent this new technique. Here I'm going to explain to you very up close three different ways that you can tackle this pointillism project. For this project, I'm using water-soluble Crayola markers. And in the first apple that you see here, I have only used marker. Now, I have used two different shades of red, a gold, a yellow, a couple different shades of green, and there's probably some orange in there too. As well as two different shades of brown. Okay. All of these colors are represented in my apple. Using more than one color helps the apple look realistic because when you look at an apple for real, it does have areas that haven't ripened yet, um, different shades of red. And then when you shine that apple up on your shirt before you eat it, you will have different areas of highlight on the outside that catch the light. So I've used these markers and I've just made little tiny polka dots with the marker and the areas that look lighter have fewer polka dots and the areas that look darker have more polka dots and they have two different shades of red. So I have a darker shade of red there, but the closer I make the dots, the darker that area appears. So we're creating value by adding more dots. I want you to think of this like uh, pixels on a computer image. The more pixels you have per inch, the clearer the image. The fewer pixels you have, the blurrier it gets. So sometimes when you try to download a picture off the internet, it looks very blurry and you can't enlarge it and print it out like you would um, a larger image size. And the reason is because it doesn't have enough dots per inch. So I'm zooming in here so that you can see all of those dots. Okay, so that's how you achieve the pointillism look. Now, in my second apple, which I tried to make pretty much the same as the first apple, I've done exactly the same thing. These two styles are identical. I just used a lot of dots. Now, for the second one, I'm using a paintbrush and a little bit of water and I'm just going to use my paintbrush to um, to blend a little bit and with just a very little bit of water I still keep some dots but all of that white from the paper that are underneath the dots areas that I didn't get those are going to turn the color of the marker because it is a water-soluble marker. So 
the marker bleeds, essentially. I'm working on watercolor paper. So my paper will not be affected by the addition of water. And I still have dots, but my dots are now um, not showing any of the white from underneath. Now I can do that in parts of my picture, or I could do it on the whole thing. See how that deepens the areas of shadow and highlight? This area that is darker looks darker than the highlight, more so than in this one. And what you can do is after you've added water, um, you can let that dry completely, and then you can come back on top of it with more marker to build up the dots again. And then in this third example, I show you what it looks like if you just use a paintbrush. So on this last example, I used my watercolor paintbrush to paint the shape of the apple, and then I used the tip of the paintbrush to create the little tiny dots that are the pointillism of this project, the pointillism aspect. And when you do that, you can do dots and let them dry and come back and do more dots and let them dry. And by layering those dots, you start to get a lot of detailed pointillism there. The key to this project is really layering. Layer, layer, layer. Make your dots, go back, make more dots. Um, in this particular area right here, I've come in with a peachy color on top of the red, and that's giving me a lighter area there. So you can play around with how you layer your colors. Dark over light, light over dark, so there are three different ways to achieve pointillism using regular color, a water-soluble marker and a little bit of water. And you don't even need watercolor paint for this. If you have water-soluble marker, you can put the marker down and then with the addition of water, that essentially becomes watercolor paint. For this project, I highly recommend that you choose a small piece of paper. In my demo video here, I am using a paper that is 11 inches by 14 inches. It is very large and it literally took me all week to work on it. So I would suggest you find a small piece of 5x7 or 5x5, five five, very small little square of paper and draw small and just create a composition that's on a miniature scale. The first thing that you might want to do, but you don't have to do, is lay down a very, very light, loose watercolor background. This makes it so the background of your picture is not just the stark white paper. I know that I'm going to paint a natural scene of a great blue heron standing on some driftwood amongst some river reeds. So I'm just creating the very loose essence of um, like a earthy ground cover and uh, just a, a hint of blue watery surface. Once I have created that background, I dry it with a hair dryer, or you can just leave it to air dry and come back to it later. Now, when you're looking at my hands working in these time-lapse videos, it looks like I'm drawing lines, but I'm really just making a lot of polka dots, teeny, teeny, tiny polka dots. And the more dots I make in one area, the darker that area becomes. I'm also selecting a variety of color. So if I'm working on the driftwood, driftwood area, I'm using uh, browns and grays. And then right now um, I'm reaching for those golds and greens to create the grasses that are coming up out of the cracks of the driftwood. This is all gonna be at the feet of my great heron. 
Now, keep in mind that this project that I'm doing in the video is going to take me more than 10 hours of work. I literally put on a book on like an audio book, a book on CD, and I just let the book play and I just work and work and work and I get up frequently and stretch and I leave the project to sit for a while and I come back and look at it and decide where I need to work more and where I need to develop more color. Um, and you're going to start to see some very um, recognizable shapes emerge the more dots I put down. Now my time-lapse videos are not going to show you the development of the entire project because that would make this tutorial video close to an hour long. The time-lapse is already at eight times speed, I think. So what you're seeing in just a couple minutes is over an hour's worth of progress. You cannot see it in this video from this angle, but I have taken a pencil and very lightly sketched out where I was going to put the heron. Um, I didn't draw it in great detail. I just did a basic outline, and now I'm following that outline with my marker. And I'm trying not to create too much of a line drawing. I'm just filling in areas that are dark naturally on the bird and the shape of the bird starts to emerge when I fill in those shadows. Areas of highlight just don't get that much marker attention. Um, I really let the paper be the highlight itself. Here we are literally 10 hours later, and you can see I've made a lot of progress on my heron. I've also been using the technique I described in the beginning of this tutorial with the apple. I applied the dots and marker, and then I came back with a small paintbrush and applied a little bit of water 
to blur the marker and then I let that area dry and then I returned again with the marker on top of that to create many different layers in the feathery body of the great blue heron. And that's how I'm getting all of those different um, shades and hues of blue. And then I switched to using a paintbrush and paint to create the reeds and the grasses. And again, I'm not painting lines. Those are all dots. So I'm just creating dots of color with my paintbrush. And like I showed you on the apple, it does look quite different than when you're just using magic marker. So play around with that. Try both techniques. Try them both on scrap paper, see which one you like best. And don't be afraid to play with them and experiment with them in your artwork. Here's a close-up of my pointillism work. And here's what it looks like from further away. So as you get further away from the picture, it really becomes very clear what your subject is. Again, this is 11 by 14 paper. It's a very large drawing. I would not recommend starting with this size if this is your first pointillism project. Start small, try it out, be patient, and if you enjoyed this art lesson, please share it with your friends and family and let others know about the Emanuel School of Fine Arts and all of the great tutorials that we have posted for your homeschooling enjoyment.